sheet. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Good. Technology has affected the way that we process the world. We are carrying in our pockets the equivalent of a supercomputer, and it is with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The capacity of information technology grows exponentially. It doubles every period of time, which is about every year. The computing power, the speed of processing data is surpassing humans. It's only a matter of time before it's maybe taking the form of a tattoo or a tiny implant. Remarkable technologies that will blur the distinction between biology and non-biology that will enable us to experience and create a world that we don't yet have. We will not be locked into this screen-based world looking down. Information will surround us in a way that is much more effortless. There won't be physical communication. It won't be written, it won't be spoken. We'll be able to perceive something and transmit that directly to another human. AI is just next social media or the next internet. Artificial intelligence is fundamentally a skill to replace all skills. I think there might have been some nonsense there. I think people may have just been saying the same cliched crap we always hear. I think maybe we should have a debate about this stuff. Maybe we need different opinions. Maybe we need to have an open mind to the fact that the people that live in Silicon Valley and spend their entire life obsessed with code and with software and algorithms who don't leave the valley, who don't speak to normal people, they may not be right about everything. When you see things that say disrupt or die, maybe that's complete crap. Maybe your business that's been making bread since the 11th century is still okay. Maybe when people say by 2020, 50% of voice searches will, will be done, maybe that's absolute nonsense. Like, has anyone here done more than three voice searches today? Has anyone done a single one? <laughs> one person has done a single one. Maybe these stats are absolute crap. Maybe when people say by 2020, the customer will manage 85% of its relationships through automation, maybe that's not really true. Maybe some companies don't yet have email addresses. Maybe some companies don't yet have mobile optimized websites. Maybe we use more paper in the office than we've ever used before. So let's have a proper conversation about this. Let's actually realize that there's a lot of nonsense that's said in the world and enjoy the provocation of these conversations. Look at this. 33% of consumers are more likely to shop in virtual reality. Has anyone ever tried shopping in virtual reality? How do we know that we would prefer that? These are surveys that are given out to people and people just say the thing they feel like they're supposed to say. They're absolute crap. It is our job to go out there and to look at people, to observe, to empathize, and to enjoy the ambiguity of this moment in time. By 2022, a blockchain-based business will be worth $10 billion. How's that working out so far? <laughs> yes, drones could change many aspects of our lives, but maybe they are somewhat of a distraction. Has anyone actually had a single package delivered of meaningful value by a drone yet? I don't think so. It's great PR. 3D printers are going to change humanity forever, but at the moment, we can only point, print out entirely pointless trinkets. Or a pizza. It's the worst ever way to make a pizza. Virtual reality headsets. They're great until you try one for more than three minutes. <laughs> we are human beings. We do not like having things on our faces. We like looking into each other's eyes. It's how we get trust with people. Maybe this stuff won't change. Self-driving cars could change everything, but no one really knows if they'll ever exist. In fact, the more you know about them, the more difficult those people accept this will be. This could change everything, but at the moment, most self-driving cars can't tell the difference between a packet of crisps and a rock. 
and that creates problems. Even human beings find it hard to drive through Tuscan hill towns. I don't know how computers are going to manage. So my job is to try and get us a little, more, little bit more calm. There should be some sound. It's to try and explore, to try and be slow, to observe, to feel our way through these moments and to try and understand that above all else, we are humans. And to try and understand that you make a lot more money standing on stages saying blockchain will kill your business, give us a check for $10 million. You get a lot more money if you're Forrester or Gartner or Accenture or Deloitte Digital or Bain or by McKinsey by saying everything is different and you don't understand it and here is the solution, give me lots of money. The reality is that we have to understand what's changing, but also what's not. What is about technology, and what is about humanity, and what is progress, and what is going backwards, and what is an opportunity, and what is a threat, and that's what this presentation will be about. And a lot of this comes down to rethinking. Like, we live our lives absorbing information, and we don't often have the confidence, or the headspace, or the time to challenge ourselves and to reprogram ourselves and to go about things differently. So that's today's menu. I'm gonna do some introductions to myself. I'm gonna go through some myths which I'd like us to bust. I'm gonna talk a lot about this interim of things, which is this mid-stage we're in right now, where we haven't yet made sense of technology. Then I'm gonna talk about digital disruption and how to rethink that. And I'm gonna talk about digital transformation and then try and end with a bit of time to do a Q&A. Enjoy this music, it's good. I like it. So yeah, we do live in a time where AI is making some things possible. We live in a world where the pace of change is in some ways accelerating, where 5G will allow us to access information more quickly. And we have Bitcoin. Does anyone here have Bitcoin? Those hands used to be higher and more proud two years ago. <laughs> You can actually monitor the stock price or the, or the value of Bitcoin by how high the hands are raised at that point. My job involves understanding that stuff, but not thinking about it too much. My job involves this. This is a screen in a library in the UK, and these are the sweat marks of disappointment. Like hundreds of small kids have come up to this screen and touched it, and nothing's happened because it's not one of those screens. A few days later, this had a little label underneath it saying, this is not a touch screen. It's that moment. It's that moment of disappointment. It's that moment of realization. That's what I'm interested in. That gap between what we expect to happen and what we routinely experience. That's interesting to me. Small children grow up in an age where they are not amazed by what is possible, they are just disappointed that things aren't as good as they thought they would be. I like machines like this. This is a vending machine in a Russian supermar uh, supermarket. And you can buy Facebook likes or friends on Instagram or comments. So if you're out shopping and you're feeling a bit lonely, you can buy some engagement, buy some friendships, buy some meaning to life. I find this interesting. This is a shower curtain. You can fit up to 16 screens in it. I like this, because imagine being so keen on content and so enamored with the internet that you need to have 16 devices, 16 things you can do at the same time. And I've come to the conclusion, because I travel a lot, that actually, the pace of change is not really that fast. Not everything is changing. You can go to many hillside towns in the Spanish countryside or in Israel. You can go to sub-Saharan Africa. And you will notice that about 10 to 7 years ago, things changed very quickly. And now, not so much. Like I would put it out to you all right now as a challenge, like, what's the biggest thing that's changed in your life down to hardware or software in the last five years? Like, Tinder, that was about 10 years ago. Twitter, nine years ago. Facebook, 
probably 12 years ago. Nothing really has changed that much. And actually, most of the infrastructure around us is annoyingly similar. Like, we do not get on aircraft and our faces are scanned and we board without uh, handing over tickets. We still have a passport. We still have a paper booklet which we have to carry with us to get permission to board a plane. Right now, you are in this room with me. This is rather like Shakespearean theater from several centuries ago, more than this is like holographic video conferencing. Like, we still enjoy face-to-face -face interaction. None of us so far have drunk anything from a 3D printed glass. We've not ordered something that's arrived by drone. We've not got here in a self-driving car. Most of the things in the world right now are annoyingly similar to how they've been before. And we need to realize that. And we need to take this time back. We are completely crap at predictions as well. If you've ever seen a film about the future, it will be Blade Runner where the main character is talking to this AI from another century, this all singing, all dancing, all knowing AI, and it's speaking to it through a payphone. If you've ever seen Back to the Future 2, there's an amazing uh, moment where Marty McFly gets fired by a fax machine, but it's a very fast, very high resolution fax machine. We are terrible at predicting the future because of two things. We can only imagine the future through the past, so we interpolate that into the future. And we tend to only be able to deal with one variable changing at the same time. So we can imagine a world with blockchain, but not at the same time as artificial intelligence and virtual reality and human gene reprinting and CRISPR technology and massive changes in wealth distribution. We can only think of one of those things at the same time. And we tend to overestimate the importance of hardware rather than software. Like, this is a cl my claim to fame. I don't know if you've seen this quote before. But you will notice from the companies mentioned in it, Airbnb, Facebook, Alibaba, none of these are physical things. If you go out into the world today, you can't actually see any of these companies existing. It's all the pipe work and the infrastructure and the business models behind the scenes. And we need to rethink and we need to reconsider what this means. I actually think we've got to a point where it's not so much that the world is difficult because it's changing faster than ever, it's just become more messy. Like we have more business models that fight with each other. We have more tension in society. We have a greater legacy of how things are done. We have airlines that are built on 1960s software with middleware to improve it for the 1980s, with a new app to improve it for the year 2000s, with a new voice interface to try and make it good for 2019. We have the foundations of the past, and they're crumbling. So I try and explore these topics. So I write for different publications. I've now been published about 800 times. And I now spend most of my time either speaking at events like this, trying to get people positive about the change in the world, or working for Publicis Group, or Publicis Media, or Zenith Media, and trying to guide our clients through these current times. I have a very personal feeling that most companies wish the internet had never happened. Like, you do not get many banks that appear to have embraced the power of what ATMs could mean, or that love the future of digital payments. You don't get hotel chains that seem to be excited by how they could text message people to tell people when their rooms are available. You do not get car rental businesses that have reimagined their business for the future. The world is full of executives that primarily are hoping to retire and are hoping not to deal with this. And I'm there to try and get them to understand the possibilities that that creates. It's a little bit of myth busting here. Um, it's common to go to marketing conferences and to see sentences like this. People want conversations with brands. Uh, you see very big stages where people put words like this on stage. Turn customers into fanatics. Uh, who here likes Pepsi? Stand up if you like Pepsi. At the front, are you, are you fanatical about Pepsi? Yeah. Would you like to have a conversation with Pepsi? Do you want to know how its weekend is going? 
Do you care about Pepsi's opinion on Christianity? <laughs> None of us give a shit about brands. Like, we prefer them, we choose them, they're important to us, but we don't want to have a conversation with them. I think there's only two brands I ever want to talk to, and it's normally American Airlines to say, where the fuck is the plane? <laughs> and I don't think it wants to have that conversation back with me. The reality is that brands are very important and meaningless at the same time. We do not think about them as much as we presume, and it's gonna be very important for us as marketers to realize that our engagement is different to what people think it is, and that people say a lot of silly stuff. At the same time, that does not mean that brands are dying. I have an enormous amount of respect for Scott Galloway. He is an utter genius, but he is entirely wrong the voice will kill brands. Like we have never had more choices to make. We have never had more content to watch. We have never had less time to think about this stuff. And therefore, having brands is an extremely useful way for us to navigate this world of abundance and complexity and decisions that are difficult. I grew up in the 1980s, and I got told two things when I was young. Don't get in a car with strangers, and don't sleep with strangers. We now have Airbnb, and we have Uber. The only reason why we get in an Uber is because of the brand of Uber. We trust them. Brands have never been more important. They've never been more valuable. In pretty much every single category in the world, we will find that the value of brands and the importance of brands has never been more important. You see the rise of movie franchises because we need to know a film is gonna be good before we see it. The rise of musicians who are famous. We used to talk about the long tail of music consumption. It's nonsense. We only tend to consume music from brands or singers that we've heard of. From university brands, to CPG products, to hotels. The importance of brands has never been bigger. This was covered earlier, but we do not have shorter attention spans than ever. We do binge watch. Anyone that's ever seen an eight-year-old play Fortnite will know that their attention span is not short. It is like crack cocaine to their brains. They cannot get away from the screen. They do not have a short attention span. You just need to keep them engaged. Um, millennials are hard to reach. Uh, this is an uncontacted tribe from the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Anyone that approaches this island in a boat gets killed by a, a harpoon. These people are hard to reach. <laughs> I'll do that one again. These people look quite easy to reach. Like, you don't have to get a boat to see them. <laughs> These people look quite easy to reach. These people look quite easy to reach. These people are easy to reach. I don't know at what point we're going to understand that these people are not hard to reach. They are surgically attached to their phones. There have never been an easier group of people to reach. And I called the millennials, and that makes me hurt inside because the notion of a millennial is nonsense. Uh, stand up if you've got brothers or sisters. Come on, look lively, come on. Now, do people get you confused? Are you so similar to your brother or your sister that people can't tell you apart? Do you buy the same products? Do you make the same choices as your brother or sister? No, you are very different. You probably don't like each other. <laughs> like the idea you can get 2.5 billion people on the planet and say, yes, you are alike, is absolute nonsense. Like, if you are not that similar to your brother or sister, why would you have much in common with someone that lives on another side of the planet, that comes from a different background, that's different races or religions? You can now sit down. <laughs> when we talk about millennials, we really mean people who are young, and young people have always behaved like young people, and we mean people that live in a modern age, and therefore they behave like people in a modern age. 
We smash those things together and call them a demographic, and it's a complete waste of all of our time. And my final one is you're either a startup or a turnaround. And I talked about this before, but the reality is if you're McDonald's, you are not about to be screwed over because Uber exists. If you are Vodafone, you're not going to be killed by a startup that's got a better app. If you're Montenegro Airlines, you know, you could do a bit better. <laughs> I hear a nerve there. But partly because I think the government owns all of you, like, you're probably going to be fine. Like, like you're not going to be jumping on a drone to take you to Podgorica anytime soon. From GSK to Twining's Tea to Walmart, like the reality is every company is not facing existential threats. But at the same time, they do need to understand that things that used to be very hard are now very easy. You can now buy my book in 183 companies, countries in the world, and it took me one hour to make this website. So you can buy it right now with three touches of your phone with Apple Pay or Google Pay. I have no idea how to make a website. I have no idea how to write copy. I have no idea how to set up a big book company. But right now, if 10 of you bought this book, this would be the third biggest bookseller in Montenegro in an hour of programming. I don't think it will arrive, by the way. I've heard bad things. <laughs> I've heard bad things about your logistics systems. So we live in an age that I call the interim of things. We live in both the future and the past at the same time. Life seems more complex and more messy and more amazing and more troubling and more chaotic and more confusing and more interesting than ever before. And that's because we're at this stage between the two worlds. We, some of us here will remember this age. We had devices that did one thing very well. You would own a magazine, a TV, a radio. There was no confusion. There will be a period in the future called the post-digital age where we create new businesses based around technology. And in this era, we will wear white clothes and things will be made out of silver and doors will go <laughs> And things will work. Things will work all the time, and we won't think about technology. But at the moment, we're in this interim where we think about technology all the time. When we watch TV, we have to figure out which remote control to use. When we pay for things, we get little handwritten desperate signs guiding us through the complexity. We have outdoor signs that just don't work because they're built on crappy Microsoft software from 1995. We used to wake up and have one inbox with about a thousand emails in it, and now we have notifications from 25 different apps, and you lose friends because you can't remember which app they used to contact you. Was it a Twitter DM? Was it an Instagram DM? Was it a like on Facebook? Oh, forget them. <laughs> and we have this promise of technology that doesn't work. What do we want? Chatbots, when do we want them? Sorry, I didn't understand your request. And we do stupid things. I bought a car today and the dealership had me check off with a pen on paper that I'm not a robot. <laughs> it's interesting because if there's one thing a robot can do really, really well, it's to do a tick on a piece of paper. So I call these times the mid-digital age. It's a period where we think about technology all the time, where life is complex, and we exist in two worlds, where we haven't taken new technology and built companies around it. We've merely taken old business models, and we've sprinkled digital garnish around them. We use digital and technology like oil to lubricate a mechanism which wasn't really created for today. And that's why we see lots of stuff which isn't that exciting. We take TV ads and we stick them on YouTube, and we're proud of what we've done. We take image-based uh, ads from the 1880s and we stick them on Instagram, and we bow and wait for the applause. We take catalogs, like the Sears catalog from the 1890s, and we replicate the same thing on digital paper. Even something as boring as a departure board is basically a digitalized version of what we saw before. And I think the main thing we need to do at this point is to really rethink what we should have built. 
Let's not take the way that we've done things before and sprinkle technology. Let's rethink what this technology makes possible. We need to rethink disruption. If you design anything, you need a constraint. You can't just be told to build a building. You need a budget, you need a time scale, you need a site. And what tends to then happen is you create these things called evolutionary funnels, where designs get better over time. They get optimized towards a perfect solution. And it looks a bit like this. We have a brief or a job to be done, and we have these criteria that we assume that narrow us towards what is an optimal solution. And this doesn't make any sense as a slide, but it does with examples. Few of you will remember this. <laughs> this was the world's first portable music player. It was the Sony Walkman. I think it was 1979, it cost about three and a half thousand dollars, and it was both the best ever personal music player and complete crap. It was very expensive, it was massive, the sound quality was poor, it didn't have fast forward. If you wanted to fast forward your tape, you either had to take it around and spin it on a pencil, or you had to take it out, rewind it, take it out again, and play it. It got better, it got cheaper, it got thinner, it got yellow, it got Dolby B. No one knew what Dolby B was, but we knew it was good. It got a radio, it got a volume button on the headphone lead. It got even better, it got really cheap, it got really thin, it got made out of aluminium, it had rechargeable batteries. We got the best ever Walkman, and it was amazing, and we were happy. And just as this came out, just as we saw the solution got better, we then got the worst ever Discman. But the worst ever Discman was still a lot better than the best ever Walkman. And we had this paradigm leap. We went from one funnel where the solution got better, where we'd worked around the same criteria, we'd worked around the same material science, we'd worked around the same problems, and we'd made this leap to a whole new world with different problems and different business models and different supply chains and a whole new world of possibility. And the discipline got better. It got thinner. It got cheaper. And it got really, really, really good. And then we got the worst ever MP3 player, but the worst ever MP3 player was still better than the best ever Discman. And now we had new problems to solve. We had to have software engineers. We needed to think about storage. Everything was different now. And MP3 players got better, and just as we got the best ever MP3 player, we got the worst ever iPhone. And the worst ever iPhone was different because you streamed music, you didn't own it. And that meant there were new problems to solve and rights management issues, and you needed different staff. Now these are paradigm leaps. The leap between the cassette player, the leap between the TV, the CD player, the leap between the MP3 player. We see them everywhere. We have them in the world of personal transport. The horse-drawn carriage, and then the horseless carriage, which was exactly the same, but without a horse. We then had them get better. And now we're on the edge of the next paradigm into electrically propelled cars. And the problems with electrically propelled cars are very different. You need different engineers, you need different lobbyists, you need to fight for different rules to be broken. And the next paradigm could be self-driving cars, and self-driving cars will look very different because we may not own them. They may go slowly. We won't need parking spaces. They will get us to rethink what cities become. You see these paradigms everywhere telling the time, the era of sundials, the era of mechanical clocks, the era of very small mechanical clocks, the era of LCD watches, and then the era of not having anything because our phones tell us the time. And these perform very different roles. Like, a, an, you know, they, they're designed in different ways. We have it in money. We have the era of cowrie shells, the era of coins, the era of paper money, the era of digital money. And then now we're on the edge of the next era where we're building payment layers on top of these old systems. And it's very interesting because paper money is not a better version of coin money. It's a very different way to solve the problem. A credit card is not the ultimate in paper money. It's a different way to solve the problem. And we need to be very mindful of these leaps. We also had it with cameras. We had the era of expensive 
photograph-based cameras, and then early digital cameras, and then now we have the cameras everywhere. So we behave like complete idiots. And you will note that the technology changed our relationship with the product. When we got to streaming music, we had a different relationship with music than we did with the cassette player. We had to endure music then. We had to be selective about what we bought. The way that cameras are now everywhere has changed our, our relationship with photography and our relationship with images. And just two little examples, vaping and cigarettes. Like vaping is an entirely different solution to the cigarette problem. Fireworks and drones. You now get what used to be firework displays and actually they're drones that fly in patterns. No one who made fireworks was ever worried that the drone business would disrupt them. No one who ever made cigarettes was worried about a liquid being heated up by a battery. These threats come from the blind side. And what we tend to find is that the most successful products in history and the most valuable companies we've ever made are the first solution in a new paradigm. So Tesla's first car was one of the best cars ever made, and it was their first ever attempt at making a car. And now you see the market capitalization of Tesla being so much greater than any car companies born in a different era. The Dyson vacuum cleaner completely changed our relationship with vacuum cleaners. It was about seven times more expensive than vacuum cleaners before it. The first ever vacuum cleaner from a guy who'd never made any form of electronics before was somehow better than all of the wisdom of every single other vacuum cleaner company out there. The iPhone, I worked with Nokia when the iPhone came out, and when it was launched, we just said to each other, shit. <laughs> because they did things that we'd assumed weren't wanted. They broke all of the rules that we'd created in our head because we knew what we were doing. And that's where things get very dangerous. You know, have these people succeeded despite this lack of experience or because of it? And increasingly, you look to companies like Red Bull, who made a product that Coca-Cola never would have made because it's objectively terrible in every way, but somehow people like it. You look to a service like Netflix, no, no entertainment company would ever have made Netflix because it breaks all of the rules. You know, someone like Mark Zuckerberg creating Facebook, he did not come from the graduate training program of the New York Times. He was someone in a dormitory thinking about connectivity in a different way. And I think that makes things very exciting. You know, we need to rethink the assumptions that we make in our life. We need to rethink the challenges that we face. We need to rethink the muscle memory the digital transformation. I am aware that digital transformation is one of those words that people use all the time and no one ever really explains. So I'm gonna try and explain it to you. If you think about a company, it's a bit like an onion. There are layers that are built on other layers. And at the very core of a company is the business model and the sort of mission and the reason to exist. And on top of that, companies create products or services or experiences. And on top of that, they create a marketing layer. This is the way that the company is able to talk about it, to promote it, to price it, to distribute it. And on top of that is the communications layer. And these outermost layers are the ones that we tend to see most clearly. These layers are the ones that are easiest to change. It's much easier to change an advertising campaign than it is to change the product that you sell. And there's two different approaches to this. So the first approach I called digitalization. And this is to take these external layers and to dabble with them with a bit of technology. It's to take your product and to stick it on the internet. It's to add a digital kiosk to your store. And it's very quick and it's very easy to do this. And it does a very good job of explaining to the financial markets that your company gets it. But it doesn't really change that much. 
Digital transformation is the process of going to the very core of a business. It's to rethink what you should have created. It's to rethink the thing, how you make it, why you make it, and it's a very painful, deep, expensive, and profound thing to do, and it requires lots of people in your company to agree. If you want to change your marketing strategy, that's a CMO conversation. If you want to change the role of a bank in someone's life, that's a very hard conversation even for a CEO to have. And what we therefore tend to see is three types of companies. Um, we see companies that have created themselves from scratch for the digital age. An app like Hotel Tonight, which is a wonderful way to book a hotel room. An app like Lemonade, which is the best ever insurance policy I've ever had because it pays you money within about five minutes of making a claim, and you make a claim by recording a video testimonial. And we will see that the fastest growing companies and the ones that we talk about all the time are these companies that have built themselves for the modern age. Now, I don't believe they are tech companies. I don't think that WeWork is a tech company. I don't think that Nest Thermostats is a tech company. But these are companies constructed new for the behaviors and the expectations and the business dynamics of the modern age. The second type of company are those that digitalize. So I talked about this earlier. And these are retailers that stick an iPad in the corner of the, of the store and they hope that someone uses it. These are banks that realizing how stupid checks are, they now allow you to take a photograph of a check so you can make the deposit more quickly. These are things like e-tickets. Like an e-ticket is just a ticket you have to print at home. This is not rethinking the way you pay for a journey. This is just getting you to print out the ticket instead of them. And similarly, kiosks in fast food stores like this. This is not reimagining the fast food experience. This is just giving you the work to do that the operators used to do before. So the really exciting companies for me are the ones that are digitally transforming. They're taking these new behaviors and these new possibilities to the core of the business itself. An example of this might be McDonald's. Like you can now order a burger on your app. They will start cooking the order as you approach the store based on GPS technology. As you arrive, you smugly walk to the, the front, pick up your burger and leave. And what is interesting about this is there are now people that wouldn't have bought a burger before that choose to do this because it's so quick and efficient. It's things like Netflix. Like every episode of a show on Netflix is the same length. It's the length the director wanted it to be. And it's wildly different from each other. For years, TV was held hostage by advertising money. A one-hour show would need to be 52 minutes in the US with three different advertisement breaks. So you needed to have a story arc that kept people's attention over that precise length. Your ability to write an interesting story was massively constrained by that. Now you can make episodes of Black Mirror, some of which are 45 minutes long, some are an hour and 45 minutes long, and the makers can do whatever they want in that time. And my final, the second to final example of digital transformation is Amazon Go. I won't play the film, but this has rethought what stores should be. This is not a store that you see the technology in, this is a store where the technology disappears into the background. It's a store where you don't think about technology, you just pick up what you want and walk out with this. And again, that means that people behave in a different way. So that makes me realize every company out there is at a different stage in this journey. There are some companies you need to construct for the modern era. There are some companies that need to do a small amount of signaling of change to the financial markets to keep up their stock price. But most companies out there really need to rethink how they need to be for the future. They need to rethink what role they should play in people's lives. And they need to go through a process where they re-engineer themselves and do significant and profound change and that's called digital transformation. And this is a journey that I think is very exciting for all of us to go on. Whichever type of company you are, 
You now need to plot your journey to create the company that you think you should have created. Now, when you do that, you will realize it's not about technology. It's much more about ideas and creativity and being empathetic about new customer expectations. We have to be realistic. Like Sam's chat yesterday superbly articulated the reality that old people do not want to change. They do not have time for those bets to pay off. It is on us as the younger, more energetic, more interesting people to provoke our companies into change. We have to think, do we want to be safe and do we want to keep a job or do we want to be proud of what we accomplish? Do we want to leave the office every Friday walking tall because we made a difference? We have to look out amongst our colleagues. Like, are there people who are better placed to lead this change than you? The horrible truth is, as you get more senior and more wise, you also get greater fixed costs in your life. You buy homes, you get married, you have less to win and more to lose. So you right now are probably best placed for this. And it probably isn't a better time to do this. Like, innovation is a bit like catching a wave. There is the perfect time to jump on it. And if you acknowledge that the future will somewhat be rebuilt around this technology and that the pace of change is not crazy and there is a little bit of a lull right now, this means there really is probably no better time to change. Let's go out there and make a difference. Thank you very much.